Good morning, church-going people. Good morning. You might have been tempted to stay in bed, but you chose to get up, get ready, and get here. I'm thrilled to see all of you. My name is Carol Bustamante, and I am your liturgist today. Please stand as you are able and join me for the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Come into the wilderness, away from familiarity, away from the known. We come to away from the scratches of the Come into the wilderness, away from familiarity, away from the known. We come Come into the wilderness, away from familiarity, away from the known. Come into the wilderness, away from familiarity, away from the known. Come into the wilderness, come into love. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Loving God, be with us today as we begin our journey through Lent, a time of anticipation and wonder, yet always overshadowed by the reality of the cross. We come to this season hoping that we might hear again in the stories of Scripture truths about your love for your people and find ourselves renewed in faith. Amen. I invite you to turn to hymn number 85 and join in singing. So that a great flood of water won't be 
teach them. You are my secret guide. You do the tiny from trouble. You surround me with the songs of rescue. So I will instruct you and teach you about the direction you should go. I will advise you and keep my eye on you. Deuteronomy, 
It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him on top of the temple and said, since you are God's son, jump. The devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. He has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so that you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. For the third test, the devil took him to the peak of a huge mountain. He gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. Then he said, they're yours, lock, stock, and barrel. Just go down on your knees and worship me, and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was curt. Beat it, Satan. He backed his rebuke with the third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only him. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. The test was over. The devil left. And in his place, angels. Angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. A word of God for the people of God. Amen.
O oh, most gracious one, may the words of my, med my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you who are our source and salvation. Amen. This scene from Matthew that we heard two versions of this morning is hopelessly overlaid with assumptions that are quite foreign to it. Christian interpreters have long assumed that Jesus is being tempted. So this scene is understood to, the, to be the parallel to instances of temptation that we as Christians experience in ordinary life. The tempting is understood to be conducted by the devil, who is understood to be Satan, who is understood to be an evil power engaged in cosmic and eternal conflict with God. The universe is understood to be a cosmic no one's land between these two equally matched powers, God on the one hand and the devil on the other. And these assumptions have their roots not in the actual text, which we can see from how uh, Eugene Peterson reinterprets it when he retranslates it, but in the way that it was understood in the Middle Ages. What is very clear is that the figure of Satan, as it appears in our usual readings of this scene, is altogether distant from the character who tries Jesus. This is not a temptation scene. This is a scene in which an appointed agent tests Jesus' readiness, tests his sturdiness, his knowledge of scripture, his love of God. The tester is a prosecutor, not a demon. I don't actually know which would be worse to face. He's an inspector with an official responsibility before God. He is not a, comic, a cosmic force arrayed against God. He is not Satan with a capital S. He is Satan, all small letters, the inspector, the tester. And looking back at Job is, is one of the ways we know that this is true. The figure of the Satan is found there as well. And though Job was written a long time before Matthew, the Satan plays a similar role in both stories, and the story in Job is actually a lot closer to Matthew in both time and social location. So it's worth considering whether or not the similarities might be greater than interpreters often assume. So let's go back to the scene in Matthew again and take another look. The first thing to notice is that Jesus was brought to the wilderness by the Spirit, the breath, presumably the breath of God. Jesus was not ambushed or kidnapped or carjacked. He was actually invited to sit for an exam. The next thing to notice is the examination began with a kind of ritual weakening of the candidate. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before the examiner showed up. And at the end of this rigorous fast, he was, as one might expect, hungry. Of course. Of course, it's so obvious you've got to wonder why we're told that he was hungry. And we know that from our own experience that hunger is not actually just a biological state. It's not just what happens to us when we haven't had our regular meals. It is also a theological and an anthropological component of what it actually means to be human. Just like Adam became fully human, fully a desiring being when God blew life into him, so too Jesus fast makes him hungry. It makes him fully alive, fully human. For this is what we are as human beings. We are individuals who hunger, who desire, who are capable of greatness and depravity. The character opposite Jesus in this scene is the tester, the prosecutor, the Satan. He's doing his job, 
testing the integrity of Jesus here at the outset of the story. And we'll remember the test, one way we could, we could um, compare it to the primary season where we get told that this is the time when we can find out who candidates really are and we can, we can find out, we, take the, we, take, we peel back um, their glowing reports of themselves and kind of dig in and we read all, everything that all the newspapers write. Who's doing that? Who's doing that? Uh, yeah, exactly. So far in Matthew, we've only heard the, you know, the, a lot of the good stuff. We've heard about Jesus' lineage. His family goes all the way back to Abraham. We know the story of his birth. And unfortunately, we also know the story of the horrible slaughter that accompanied his birth. We have seen how he was drawn to John the Baptist, how he went to like one of the most popular people in the wilderness to get baptized. And all these factors that led up to the birth of Jesus have prepared him and his family for this moment in history, this moment when God's people struggle under the weight of the Roman Empire. Jesus' whole story, presumably, has prepared him for such a time as this. And he has been born, grown to adulthood, and now the question is, is he really ready? Is he fit for purpose? Is he the right guy? He was being tested. For what? Every test measures something. It measures one sort of thing and not another. Whether we're taking the SATs to get into college or a road test to get our driver's license, tests are specific. And this week I heard a, a podcast from Malcolm Gladwell criticizing the LSAT. That's the test that aspiring lawyers must take to get into law school. And Malcolm Gladwell was arguing that while the writers of the test seem to work hard to ensure there was no cultural bias or gender bias, they did seem to have a bias for hares rather than tortoises. He's speaking of the story of the tortoise and the hares there. Apparently, and I think we can fact check Gladwell with a couple of people in the room who might have taken the LSATs. I think we have a few. Um, the LSAT is strictly timed and rewards answering quickly. So maybe even, it maybe even rewards rushing through it. Each section being 25 questions that must be answered in, I think, 35 minutes. Is this right, Neil? Sort of, but you probably can't remember. <laughs> distant, distant past. But you, um, the hare can move through the test very quickly. The tortoise, however, is kind of penalized for the fact that the tortoise wants to ponder each question and read it carefully. However, Maybe the tortoise is actually the one who makes the better lawyer because they do their work of legal analysis carefully with close reading of the texts. Every test is designed to sort, to rank order, to weed out. The LSAT is designed to help the top 14 law schools in the country figure out who to admit. Every test reveals one sort of weakness and not another. And each test reveals its own sort of strength. In this case, in the case of the LSAT, what, oh, sorry, I'm back to Matthew now. In this case, in the case of Matthew, what is the tester the Satan actually looking for? In his story, the tester pokes at Jesus' hunger. He wants to know if Jesus is going to leap above his humanity. If he's gonna say, okay, I've had enough. I've had my 33 years of humanness, I'm done. The tester wants to find out whether Jesus will expect special privileges, expect the laws of nature to change so that he will be able to have bread to eat without relying on someone to bake it, someone to grind the meal, someone to harvest the grain, someone to plant the wheat. Will Jesus ask for something that the world does not actually give? This is the first test. In the second test, the tester wants to know if Jesus will follow in the footsteps of so many other holy ones and court the miraculous to amaze and awe other people. The top of the temple where he's invited to go is a place where the temple priests would stand. 
And in Jesus' time, many of them would claim to be able to do the miraculous, trying to recruit followers with amazing wonders. And would Jesus do that? Would he actually do something amazing simply to inspire and awe the tester? In the third test, Jesus is offered all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus is offered dominion, maybe even domination, over all the kingdoms of the world. What a powerful invitation, given the thrust of Jesus' story thus far, given the oppression and the violence of the Roman Empire in which he grew up. If Jesus dominated everything, Israel would never go into exile again. All of the past wrongs throughout Israelite history could be righted. All that needs to happen is that Jesus worship the tester. Will Jesus worship anyone other than God in order to gain dominion over the world? These tests, the tests of bread and miracles, domination, identity, they're actually the messianic tests. Those are the arguments about whether or not Jesus was the one who the Hebrew scriptures foretold. Is Jesus the Messiah? Well, we'll know Jesus is the Messiah because he can pass these tests. These are the tests that connect Jesus' story to all the stories and arguments about who the Messiah will be and what the Messiah can and will do. They are not the test that you or I would ever be subjected to. Let's not confuse the tests for Jesus with our own temptations and trials. It is interesting to consider, though, whether we might learn something about how to handle our own tests from how Jesus handled his. In each case, Jesus turned back to the Hebrew scripture to find the resources to answer back. And these lines of scripture are like principles from which he could figure out what to do. Consider his exhaustion after 40 days of fasting. Consider his isolation after 40 days of being alone. When challenged to accept a reasonable alternative path, an easier path, when invited to use his power to fix everything, he was not guided by that kind of reasonable, practical opportunity. He was guided instead by the sacred words, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Guiding principles. These words seem to have been what steered Jesus in his conversation with the tester. But frankly, there are days, many days, when this approach to dealing with these tests is incredibly frustrating to me. What if Jesus had just done the other thing? What if Jesus had relented and become ruler of all? Wouldn't our real lives be very different now? Wouldn't disease, famine, poverty, and warfare, wouldn't those all be things of the past if Jesus had just relented? There are some days when I wish that he had. But then I'm called to remember that these were tests. Tests are designed to test something. They are not promises of outcomes or magical ways to zoom forward to a perfect world. Even doing well on the LSAT does not promise a successful law school experience or a successful career practicing the law. They are tests. Jesus' response to those tests was to rely on the word of God, the scriptures. His response was to believe all that he had been told up to that point in his life. Do you remember what happened to him right before he went into the wilderness? He was baptized by John. He searched John out in the wilderness. He asked to be baptized. The skies opened overhead, and a voice claimed Jesus as a beloved son. 
Jesus answered the tester out of his belief in what had just happened to him. He was claimed by God, ordained by God, and he believed it. Various studies have shown us that we tend to become what the most important people in our lives see us as. We tend to become what the most important people in our lives see us as. And then we tend to act according to that image that we take on kind of as a self-image. If those closest to us tell us how much we matter or how much we don't matter, that is what we will come to believe, and that is how we will begin to act in the world. The self-image that Jesus brought with him into the wilderness was beloved son. Who is the most important person in your life? And how do they look at you? And what then do you believe about yourself? And maybe even more important, to whom are you? the most important person? And how do you look at them? And what does that look tell them about themselves? When I began my ministry, one of the most important people, and arguably still one of the most important people in, me, in my life, was my dad. And some of you have met him. He has come here for worship. He's tall, has gray hair. He looks like a New England. Doesn't he look exactly like a New England minister should look? Yes. And for those of you who've seen him, um, for a long time as I was preparing for the ministry, he viewed me as his daughter. Beloved, yes, I want to believe I, I, we're, we're loved, yeah, but a daughter. And then he saw me as a student, someone studying to be what he already was, a pastor. And sometimes our conversations were actually about how much he was still arguing with his seminary experience. Throughout all of this time when I was studying and in conversation with him, I was trying to finish my ordination paper. Uh, it was a real struggle to finish that paper, as some of you might remember, and to kind of find my center and my call. One day he came to the church that I was serving up north um, to help me with communion because I wasn't ordained and I couldn't serve communion. And he listened to me preach and he watched me preside. And after that service, we talked over coffee and a donut, like we always do, about the service and the text. But his conversation with me felt very different to me for some reason. It, it, it somehow was as if we were colleagues now, and no more father and daughter. And he said to me, I see it. I see it. And wouldn't you know, once he could see it, I could see it. And I could actually finish that paper. We become what the most important person in our lives sees us as. And friends, here is the really good news. No matter what is happening in your family, or at work, or on the train, or on the street, or in school, the really most important person, the most important anything there is, already looks at you already sees you and already loves you. God doesn't see the sad story of Adam. God doesn't see the sad things we do in our lives, the dreary failures. God sees the faithfulness of Jesus and sees us in him. And perhaps, just perhaps, if we can believe that God sees us that way, we can start to see ourselves that way, too. And what a difference that will make for our lives and for the lives of those we see. Lent is a time to consider our priorities, to wonder about the principles that we've built our life around. What is it, you, what do, what is it that we've chosen to live by? And when tested, when put to the test, do those principles actually help us? Do they actually guide us through? Or do they just make it worse? Who do we decide to believe in? The ones who demean us? Or the one who has already said we are the beloved? May your journey through Lent, may your walk with Jesus to Jerusalem, 
clarify for you that you are seen, you are beloved, you have already been found worthy by the most important one.